Ladies and gentlemen, are stars alive? All right. Why Why do you say... So uh, we should so, just run let, the sentences let, we were doing just before that to tell them what we were up to. Yeah. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're looking at uh, the, trying to figure out a, a key component of what is being a, a, a living creature, then what a key component of that is that it has to be a process, an open system, an open-ended system. In other words, matter and energy has to flow through it. So in our case, literally, we have uh, uh, orifices where matter and energy flows through, right? So uh, in order to be alive, you cannot just be like a, a self-contained system. And one of the uh, when when I was studying uh, just uh, ordinary astrophysics, I was playing around with the idea that maybe the stars could be some kind of organism, but I I rejected the idea because it does it doesn't have any matter and energy flowing through it. It's just a con like it starts out with fuel, and then it burns to it, to the end. Yeah. So it, so that's that's not consistent with how a living organism would be. But if there's something to this electric universe idea, then there's a lot of things that have to go. One of the things that have to go is that, that gravity is the dominant force in the universe. But another one is that maybe stars are not self-contained. They're not necessarily driven by nuclear energy or only by nuclear energy. They may be tapping into a stream of electrons, like uh, they're they're drinking from uh, from electricity. They're they're tapping into these uh, filaments of current in the universe. And if that's true, that part of the power from stars comes from uh, outside, then energy and matter does flow through the the system. And that means that if they were subject to natural selection, then stars could potentially be living organisms. Yeah, you, 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 I mean, that's kind of a stretch. I mean, first of all, I have to say living organisms are, um, re they reproduce. That's one of the definitions of life that you have to put in there. And stars don't reproduce. Ah, uh, don't they? They evolve. Now, now, notice that if the electric universe theory is correct, then a lot about what we, we understand about stars just needs to be rewritten from scratch. Now, how, in what way do they reproduce? They, they, they move to a certain uh, state, and then they explode, and more stars can come no. from that? That that is not a, a, self, a given that this is what happened that they this, they evolve to some kind of final explosion. That's not For a my, given. So, like, if the electric universe theory is correct, then we may have to rethink everything about stars. In other words, you can't just use anything that you know about stars and say that this is how stars work. Okay. But let me talk about reproduction for a while. There is a very very famous astronomer called Halton Arp. He was known as like the super, uh, super wonder boy of astronomy for a long time because he was just able to get these wonderful pictures from uh, observations. But then after he did all these strange things, he found so many strange uh, objects in space that he made like a, an, an, an entire index of weird objects and they contradicted a lot of what we know about redshift and how fast things move. <clears throat> and what he basically formulated based on this is noted that a lot of the, the so-called quasars may not be very far away, but they have intrinsic redshift. They, they are born from, from galaxies, and they're ejected from the center of the galaxy. And when they're ejected, uh, they start out very with high redshift. And as they grow older, they become more and more blue shifted. So things speed up inside them. Time, the, the, the atomic clock is going up faster and faster. And as they grow, uh, go up faster and faster, they grow in size. And as they grow in size, they become new galaxies. 
So if he's actually correct about that, there's been, there, uh, now there's a lot of pushback on that idea, but he did a lot of work that needs to be covered again. Like his, he did excellent work, and we can't just dismiss him out of hand. People have to go through this and take it seriously. <clears throat> and if he's right about that, then galaxies, at least on the galaxy levels, they do reproduce, and quasars are ejected ga uh, baby the galaxies. That's very, very strange. How, how, <clears throat> how seriously do you take that hypothesis? I, w do we see evidence of that? I, in, with the Hubble telescope, do we see evidence of quasars being ejected from the center of galaxies? That's, his, that's uh, honestly very bizarre. Now, uh, he, he made a map of these quasars, and you can point them in positions along like an axis. You have like a, you, you know the, uh, the, the galaxy, and on, on, on both sides of the galaxy, through the, the galaxy uh, uh, rotation axis, you see two quasars with the same redshift on the opposite sides of the galaxy. And, and we, we, we see many of them. This is like many examples of this. So we have observational evidence that can be portrayed into this uh, system, but then it's dismissed. Now this is just a chance, it's just coincidence, blah, 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 something like that. Mm -hmm. so but I think that there's sufficient evidence from this that we can't just dismiss it. You think stars then may be re If that's true then they, they may be reproducing. And maybe not at this, entirely at the star level, but perhaps at the, the galaxy level. What are the implications for that? Now, that is crazy. I'm not going to even speculate on that. But like it, basically, that means that stars may be behaving teleologically. Can you give a sentence of speculation as the direction that goes? What is their purpose or what's their goal? Just I, to reproduce I, themselves? Now, let me give you an example. Uh, this is like uh, the, the basis of like a science fiction uh, novel I've conceived of. But if it's true that uh, uh, it's, this is what stars do, that they are looking, they are looking for <clears throat> food, electron. Now, what you can find then is that you can have something akin to a predator star, a star that is just like a virus that floats around uh, in space, and it tries to look for these currents of electricity and hang on to them and use them to slide in towards an existing star and take over. Come on, what do we see when we look out in the Hubble, Hubble field? We don't see this stuff going on, do we? we? What we do know after some studies is that most of what goes on in the universe, we don't see. We're just seeing a snapshot of it? Yeah, because there was recently like a paper uh, <clears throat> where they tried to look at the, the dark spots of Hubble. Like if they actually make us a map of the stuff where Hubble sees nothing, and then there's a shockingly high, like I'm talking visibly now, that's a shockingly large part of, of the sky. Right. And then, and then they use this to try to, to map out how much of the map, like the visible matter, ordinary matter in the universe, is not seen by Hubble. And that was quite a, a big amount. So basically, a lot of things goes on. And let me give you an example of something that we didn't see coming, or that happens all the time. Uh, we see meteors just coming out of nowhere, heading for Earth, and we we're happy that, oh, they missed. But we didn't know it was there. All of a sudden, it just came. And recently, there was like an object that didn't come from uh, this um, um, uh, planetary system, the solar system. It came from outside our own solar system, and it was something that looked like an asteroid. Uma Uma? Yeah, that's the one. And it came from and a direction, it came from outside the galactic plane, right? 
Yes, it was a weird. Uh, it was a weird direction. Yeah. And and what, where did it come from? We don't know. And the, my point is not here to speculate about that. But the fact is that most of what goes on is going on in darkness. Like think about how much of the, even the sea floor, our own sea floor on our own Earth, is unmapped. Is it like ninety percent? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and so you're saying outer space is like that. Well, what are you? So what are you proposing goes on? You're saying if we knew more of what went on, we'd have more evidence. We would have more evidence, yes. So uh, definitely. So, and the thing is also what we've discovered. This is something that uh, uh, was a recently published paper <clears throat> that they were they are building algorithms for looking for things. So these algorithms specifically only look for certain particular forms of patterns. Yeah. And if they, if they deviate from those patterns, you don't see them. And most of what we discover now, when you say, oh, we discovered a new planet, uh, extraterrestrial planet, uh, then uh, they, uh, uh, they've used some kind of filter. And so what someone recently did is they went over the old data and they say, we're just going to upgrade the uh, the filter, the, the algorithm. And when they did that, they discovered a whole bunch of new extraterrestrial planets. I've wondered about that, whether they, by writing these AI programs of various kinds, whether or not they're painting themselves into a corner where they've written the assumptions into the programs. They're and, Kantians in yeah, a very literal sense. And now they see they're, what they want. Yeah, exactly. Now they're just looking at the data that they have written in for it to give them. Yep. So that's like the Kantian filter of reality, right? Yeah. Uh, we know that the world is not like that. Uh, so therefore, we know that if they write the, uh, if you write a better algorithm, you can overcome this problem. We can always find new things. But it means that even if you look, if you're looking at the sky. I think about how often you do this in your own life. You go through a city, and that one day you all of a sudden discover that I've actually never seen that house before. I've passed here a million times, and I've just never seen it. Is that a restaurant? I've, is there a restaurant there? And then you ask people, yeah, that restaurant's been there for 40 years. I didn't know that. I've been here for a long time. So, and I thought I knew it, uh, everything there, but I just walked by and didn't see it. So, obviously, if we can have such mundane experiences like that on Earth, where we are just bathed with information all the time, obviously that's also the case up in, in outer space. Right. And the things we're not looking for, well, we're not seeing evidence for. Now, I, 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 this also bothers me with regard to archaeology, because... Um, they dig a ditch three feet wide and 20 feet long in the area that they want to sample. And I think they it's just... very problematic. They should just dig up the whole damn area, you know? But yeah. there's a problem with but, resources, manpower, and etc. But but there's an even a bigger problem with that. I don't know if you're familiar with these ideas of uh, civiliz uh, some kind of civilization existing before, uh, like, 10,000 years ago. Yeah. Well... Around 11 or 12,000 years ago, there was a major cataclysm which may have given or probably gave rise to these flood myths. So we knew that in the span of just a few weeks, perhaps a few days, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sea level rose maybe like 30 yards or 10 yards, something like that. It's like an insane increase. That's flooding. That's real flooding, right? Virtually instantly on a Virtually geologic instantly. time scale. And like, if there was a civilization, human civilization, oh, nice. If there was a, a civilization prior to that, where would their cities be? Uh, by we would assume by rivers and by the ocean, the same place we make our cities, we would assume. So 90% of our cities are by the ocean. They are near the coast. And so if there was a massive sea level rise uh, 10,000 years ago, these places are all underwater. Underwater, and we're not looking there. 
like the the area between London and um, France was a very fertile, low-lying grassland. Yep, and you can walk. That's why there was uh, like a population there uh, in the like the Stone Age. Yeah, people people walked from France to um, to Britain, and outside Britain, between Britain and Norway and the Netherlands. There is even today uh, an area, low air, low lying area called the Dogger Bank. It's it's uh, the, uh, previously previously it was a part of Britain and then it became an island called the Dog Doggerland. And it, only a few thousand years ago, that part of the North Sea was above above water. Now it's below. Yeah. So they, if fishermen have reported for years that when they fish in that area, it's a very good fishing place, and they get axes and all sorts of other uh, tools caught in their nets. Mm-hmm. From underwater. Yeah. Yeah. And no one's looking there. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, now I think that uh, that uh, something hit the ice sheet up in Canada. Canada or Greenland or wherever. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of evidence for that. I mean, you, do you know about the the bay? What are they called? The bay, Biscay Bays, or I've talked to you about that before, right? I think so. Like there, there are lots of like uh, circular shaped, uh, uh, oblong uh, shaped, o oblong shaped uh, uh, areas where there has been like a huge amount of water. Falling down, and you can fall. It's all over. America, find this all over Eastern America. Yeah, all coming from a an ejection point somewhere up in Canada that would yeah. have been covered by a very thick ice sheet ten thousand years ago, like two miles or one more than one mile thick. Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely a lot to that, and then there's things like in Turkey. There's that uh, very very old. Uh, city that Teotihuacan. Oh, I can't remember. No, that's a South American name. Do you know this? Oh, Hola or something. Holy. Uh, I'm not able to uh, go for that. You have Gobekli Tepe. Is that what it is? Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe is like it was uh, deliberately put underground. Mm -hmm. It's not a city. It's like a, like a temple area with all these rocks with uh, carvings on it. Go back to Tepe. And Tepe is written Tepe. Like Pepe. Pepe the Frog. T E P E? Yeah. Go back. Go back. Go back to with K. Tepe. Go back to Tepe. Yeah. Now. That's 10,000 years old. It was buried by hand by humans deliberately 10,000 years ago. Now. Uh, a lot of let's see who uh, who is the who's the uh, skeptic guy Michael Shermer was yeah. asked about this and he just hand waved it yeah he has no answer to that what are we going to do with the, with if civilization and farming arose five thousand years ago what are we going to do with extremely advanced stuff that's ten thousand years old well farming didn't arise five thousand years ago it arose ten thousand years ago it arose fifty thousand years ago. No, no, no. Uh, it may have, well, it may have, but uh, farming as we know it, we have no evidence of farming anywhere on planet Earth except for around 10,000 years ago. But say that it was here 20,000 years ago, what evidence could but, we possibly have? I know, it's uh, wild one the, speculation. One of, the things, one of the things that is against uh, this idea is the fact that the CO2 level was very low. Okay. Nothing grew 20,000 years ago. The CO2 level was very low, 20,000 years yeah. ago. It was so cold that the oceans absorbed all the CO2. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. So it was almost the death of all plants. Well, farming but, will have been wiped out. Uh, yeah, but if that existed. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't mean it didn't exist before, though. That That's true. That It could have existed 100,000 years ago. But my point is that um, farming as we know it now didn't emerge until 10,000 years ago, and it was enabled by increase in CO2. But because prior to that, the Earth was a desert, mostly. There was like some plants, they're called C4 types uh, plants, 
so they can uh, grow even at low CO2 levels. So those are grass, grass types. Many grass, most grass types that you see are C4 plants. But C3 plants, those are like trees and most of you of agricultural stuff. They need carbon and, dioxide for food. And at the low level that it was during the ice age, the low ice age, basically nothing grew except for a little bit of grass somewhere. And uh, so in the tropics, you had a tiny patch of um, jungle uh, and you had a uh, steppe landscape, other places, but lots of desert all over the world. Nothing grew. Isn't it funny how the nihilistic hippies, they want to destroy civilization in order to make room for the plants and stuff, and yet they actually want to destroy the plants as well because they want to do away with CO2, which is plant food. Yeah, but uh, that, that just goes to say that these people are not completely well put together. Yeah. But returning to this idea of, uh, of reproduction uh, in stars, now that's speculative. But what I'm saying is that we know that uh, wherever you have an unstable process where if energy and matter flows through the system where there's a possibility of death. That is exactly the condition you need for natural selection and for teleology. So I'm not saying that stars are alive, but if someone came back with incontrovertible evidence of this, that stars have actually undergone evolution and that all the galaxies are uh, in, the, in the universe are reproducing themselves, I, I'm not the one that's going to say that that's... I'm very surprised about that. Uh -huh. Now, what do you think about uh, the fact that stars explode in the supernova give us all of these different uh, elements, and, you know, the electric universe has got a whole different model for stars. Are you worried about that? No, I'm not, because one thing doesn't exclude the other. I mean, uh, you can have nuclear power if you want, which may not just be the only thing that that's at work. And, and the electric universe has some pretty powerful stuff for creating something that looks like a supernova. Uh, if, you take, if you take very strong currents, plasma currents, and you connect them, you get like a, a plasma knot. Uh, and this is basically, uh, this is the type of explosions you sometimes see in uh, high voltage systems on Earth. So if you have this kind of connect, uh, where, you, where you get this uh, plasma arc that connects, uh, so you get a short, uh, short circuit, you get a plasma explosion. And even on Earth, this plasma explosion <clears throat> is so powerful. Now, so, uh, it, can that be like a? I've seen that they have the idea of there's the uh, some of the no, supernova that it keep exploding over and over, and the yeah. scientists say that they're coughing off gas, they're belching, and they're like it's spasming. But yeah. uh, the electric universe has a a view of that as well, which is a pulsating. A pulsa pulsating, yeah. Yeah. Pulsating electric phenomenon, or something like and that. And the same, they have the same explanation for pulsars. Instead of pulsars spinning around at a very high speed, they can just pulsate at a high speed. Oh, interesting. Huh. I, I, I so, have been, I'm, I was, this, I, how are we going to get rid of the spinning pulsars, though, in the sense that it seems to make sense how they arise? Are we going to well, take exception? I mean, look, the, the electric universe is fun, but are you sure that they're not going to have to adopt a lot of the stuff we already have about this stuff? I'm, I'm not sure about anything. I, but I'm, I'm, I'm sufficiently sure that I understand that we have to take it seriously. It, there's just no, if, you're, if you're not taking the, uh, the electric universe thing seriously, then you're not really a serious cosmologist. 
Yeah, I think it's got I think it's got a lot of stuff in it that needs to be uh, taken account of. So the my, the gateway drug for me into the electric universe was electric comets. Yeah, that was very convincing, wasn't it? And because uh, the fact that when you now they're trying to send these probes up to uh, these uh, uh, so-called s- s- dirty snowballs and they can't land on them because they're too hard. And they, when they look at get pictures from them, they, they look like a rock. They look indistinguishable from an asteroid. And they're full of craters. And then when they try to put uh, something and explode into it, it creates massive uh, explosions that contain much more energy than they ever imagined. And yeah. they don't create crater impacts. Because these things have been flying throughout our space, and they have a very, very high electrical charge because there are... Uh, there are electric currents in deep space. Yeah, you have potential difference in between the sun and outside of the sun. So that potential difference, when you move things through a potential difference, you get a charge difference, and, and then you get electricity. Now, why didn't NASA take account of that? Because they're idiots. They spend millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, sending these spacecraft there. Meanwhile, people are telling them, hey, that's going to have an extremely uh, high electric charge when you get there. It's a shame. But, yeah, that's, that's, that, that was one of the first things that got my attention. I said, and here's, here's the thing. Just when I was reading about electric comets, I think this was in 2005, then there was, I think it was the hale Bop comet. That ex- I just read about this, and then the hale Bop came to Earth and was gone away from us. It, we could no longer see it in the sky. And then, as it passed by Jupiter, or I would think it was Saturn, it exploded out of nowhere. And it, it was increased in brightness by a factor of like one million or one billion. I don't remember quite how much. It was, and it, it filled the sky. It was so large that it, it was the size of the sun in the sky. And you, I could go out in winter and see it with my bare eyes. This tiny thing, so-called snowball, that had exploded uh, <clears throat> and just become this huge thing. I don't know. I don't recall the, the episode you're talking about. I recall, well, I saw it with my own eyes, so... Um, Hail, uh, Hail Bop? I think that's the one. Brighton? Hail Bop Brighton, yeah. Or explodes. Comments Hail Bop. I don't recall the episode, but no, I, I this is not the one. Um, I don't. This is this is not the one. So I, I, I listen. Exploding uh, Comet 2007. Let's see if this is the one. You're not thinking of the one that hit um, Jupiter, are you? I think it may be Comet Holmes. Yeah, Holmes became notable during its October 2007 return when it temporarily brightened by a factor of about half a million in what was the largest known outburst by a comet <clears throat> and became visible to the naked eye. A flare of Comet Holmes. All right. it, is, it also briefly became the largest object in the solar system as its coma expanded to a diameter greater than that of the sun. Despite months of observation for hundreds of telescopes, the cause of its dramatic explosion remains unknown. Now, what do what do you think it ran into something or what? 
No. Do you uh, think it was a build-up? The, the, electric, the electric universe, people say, that it passed by Saturn, and there was a sunstorm just a few days before. So it, in, in, uh, there was a very strong electromagnetic interaction between, uh, I think it was Saturn, and this solar storm. And the solar storm is a burst, an electrical burst, right? Yeah. So for so so when when that storm reached the the comet, it exploded due to electric stress. That's what they believe, and I think it's a fair thing. So that was very like that was one of those aha moments for me when it came to the comets that this electric universe theory might have something to it, because that was very convincing. Yeah, it's hard to get hard to get away from some of the the evidence uh, that the scientists themselves have no idea what's going on. You couch it in elect electric universe terms, and at least we have some some direction to go. Yeah, but I'm like, so I feel very confident that there's something going about comments that has to do with electricity, and that there, there are not snowballs. But there's a big big problem with this. For the traditional scientists, because <clears throat> everything hinges on these uh, comets to uh, be come from the Oort cloud out uh, far out in the space. Yeah, remnants of the beginning of our uh, solar system. Thanks. Because if they're not, this screws up everything we know about the solar system. And what do you think about the Oort cloud uh, in light of the well, it, electric universe? Well, it's, it, it is a, it, it, no one has ever observed it. It's literally an invention to explain comets. True. Uh, it's, it's also a very obvious result of the nebula hypothesis. Yes. And if they, but the thing is, if the electric universe is right, that these are actual rocks, asteroids, then we have a big, big problem. Because they don't come from the Oort cloud then. They come from within our own solar system. And we know that they don't last a long time. Uh, an asteroid, does, uh, a comet doesn't survive many uh, turns around uh, the sun. True. So they can live. They can live for some cycles, but they can't ling live for very long. So this means that these asteroids, these comets, have to be relatively new objects. And when I say new, perhaps at most uh, a couple of million years old, but maybe only a few thousand years old. Now, you you conceived of the Oort cloud as being outside of our solar system. Isn't isn't it part of the larger no, ecosystem? Yeah, they claim that it's part of it, but it's so far out and no one's ever seen it. And the only reason they say it it's, it exists is because of these uh, comets. But if comets is created another way, you don't need the Oort cloud. Well, how else would they be created? Uh, that is the scary part because there is really only one. <laughs> natural explanation for that, an explosion of a planet. Or a previous star. But they are, they, they're made out of rock that looks like stuff from a planet. But uh, stars are made of iron at, their, at the end of their life cycle. Yeah, okay, but, uh, okay, I see what you mean there, but it can't, uh, work, it, that's, not, that's not likely. The likely scenario is that we know that we find that there's an asteroid belt around uh, between Mars and I think Jupiter. Yeah. So there's there's a missing planet. Well, I don't know about that. There's um, you know Lagrange points and uh, that stuff. I think yeah. I think we can explain the instability of that particular area of space. We would simply expect to find. Um, disorder in in that area of space because it's not resonant. The frequencies are not resonant such to create order. But 
the thing is that we can create a very nice like uh, uh, formula for the distance between the planets. And uh, this missing planet fits nicely into that into that uh, spectral sequence. So it is a resonant point. It's precisely where we should expect to see a planet. Uh, I thought that it was not a resonant point, and that's why everything was in pieces there. But I don't know math well enough to know what I'm saying. So. They have they have no idea of why the the asteroid belt is, is there. They they're making conjectures, and that's the problem with physics. You build conjectures on conjectures on conjectures, which is okay if you're on solid ground, but they're not. So here's one possibility. Uh, this uh, thing between Mars and Jupiter, or maybe some other object, crashed or exploded and ejected. The, a lot of it became like debris running around in circles as like an asteroid belt. But some of it was ejected so far out that it gets very elliptical orbits. And those are now returning back in the form of asteroids. All right. And then we don't have to have the previous nebula and the solar system nebulas uh, yeah. Yeah. hypothesis? But the, yeah. So this opens up a whole new door that, uh, that the current astronomers don't like to go down because it means that they have to start from scratch. Yeah. It calls into question everything we know. And the fact, for instance, that uh, if the, the coma, the tail of the comet is not created, as they think, by reflecting light from this melting snow, snowball, but it's actually a plasma, uh, glowing class plasma, then that's, there's only one way that that can happen, and that it's if there's an electric potential difference between the outer solar system and the and the sun, which means that there is an electricity there. There's there's electricity in space. There's a current. Yeah. What's the source for the electricity? They they is that their problem? Is they don't want to? They don't like anything of this. They, <laughs> they don't like it. any of it, right? But f for one thing, they can't. They we they do, they want a source for the electricity in space, but it's there. We know it's there. Well, 99% of what we observe, the visible universe, is plasma, right? But they say, ah, oh, that's just a coincidence. There's no, there, it's inactive plasma, they say. So they have this convoluted way of uh, explaining things away. Any, anything that's not convenient and doesn't fit within gravity. That's Gravity. right. Gravity is their holy grail. I don't get that. I don't get why gravity is their holy grail, and gravity is not even sufficient for the the few things we're trying to explain. But it's their everything has to fit gravity. I don't know. I just don't know. So that's uh, all I can say about that. Uh, I think that uh, I have to bring this to an end now. Oh, that's nice. Oh, Starting you. to get shape. Yeah. I have to bring this to an end because I have like uh, I have some uh, stuff to do now. All right. Uh, well, I but, was uh, I was meant to go to a parade, so I should be get, getting on my way. Damn it! All right. Well, thank Keep you going. for the discussion. Very good. We uh, we were able to go through some interesting topics, to topics not relating to human life directly, right. but interesting nevertheless for those who like those kind of speculations. Yeah. All right, we're our stars alive. The yeah, end. that's a, that's nice. All right. All right. Thanks again, owner. Okay. So talk, talk to, to you soon. later. Our stars alive. That was some crazy.